Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I am Barry Rowland. In this episode, we will be reviewing the latest edition of the GT4 racing wheel from the guys at Sim Magic. It looks to be a good all-around use type of wheel solution with a lot of functionality. It can be used as a standalone USB connected wheel or connected to Sim Magic's own wheelbase solutions. Time to put it through the SRG's review process and see how it does. So, let's get to it. Let's take a closer look at this GT4 wheel from the guys at Sim Magic. Out of the box, first thing I do is grab the grips, obviously, and see what they feel like. <laughs> and I have to say, right out of the box, it feels pretty good. It seems like we got a good ergonomic feel to these grips. They have a good wrap around the back here for the curl of the fingers as they wrap around the grip. And it has a good texture to it. It's it's not sticky, I would call it, but it's not slick in, the, in, in any means. It's just, it gives a good texture, I think. It's kind of a leather-like texture, even though this is a rubberized type of polyurethane that they use for this injection molding. But it feels pretty good as far as being able to maintain your grip on it. Of course, the shape of the handle helps that too. And I don't know if you guys can see that pattern we have there. And you can see our injection molding seam in there. Again, that you can't feel that seam. It's well finished. Very nice and smooth there. On the back, we have a good drop-off on the spoke part. You know, some wheels don't have that nice drop-off. They just have it kind of thick in there and you can't, you kind of, kind of, your fingers don't kind of get curled around well enough on those. And again, that's subjective to the size of your hand and the size of your fingers. And we have a nice square flat piece down here for their, a nice curl on our fingers when we're using the wheel. Gives us a good grip. It's got kind of a raised part here, as you can see. It's fatter in the back than in the front. You can see there's our seam and you can see there's more of it in the back there than it is in the front. But right in that palm swell area, it feels pretty good to me. Again, I have a small hand. When I order gloves, I have a size small and even extra small in some gloves, depending on the manufacturer. So keep that in mind when I'm talking about this stuff. So it feels good to me anyway. And it's got this little groove. It's very subtle, but it works. It, it definitely does something. And well, you can see that there in the light, but there's a groove right in here. And that's your thumb kind of follows that groove as you wrap your hand around it. And that again helps facilitate a good lock grip around the wheel. I like to see it a little deeper, but the fact that we have any there is better than some of the wheels I have where it's just rounded there. So it's subtle, but it works. It's one of those things that I was not expecting. When I first wrapped it, it felt good, and I started looking at it in detail. Why did it feel good or not good? That's what I always do with grips. And I could see how they did that. And you can see how it's, it's raised right in here, too, to make that happen. It's kind of a hump right in here to give that little groove feel. And there's also, let's see if I can show that in the light, a little beveled piece here instead of just a round roll off there's a, a little flat spot in here before it goes into the flat in there and even the seam on the inside internal is very smooth so well finished on the grips here really i don't have anything to complain about on these grips but then again like i said we don't know for sure until we get in and we start driving it all right the front plate here is a solid carbon piece and it goes through the grips and it's a very thick piece of carbon. Probably the thickest I've had in the old SRG. Let's see. Most of them, I think the thickest one I've, I've had is five. Some come in at four. And this one, I think, goes a little bit over five. Yeah, 5.25 5 or so. Five and a quarter. So, yeah, they've, they've erred on the side of too much. <laughs> which is always a plus in my book. Turn it back around. Which gives it a good stiff feel, by the way. And, of course, this aluminum housing in the back doesn't hurt that nice stiff feeling. Yeah, it feels pretty good in hand. I really have a lot to complain about there. And yeah, the carbon on here is a good weave. It has a nice weave to it. I can't find any defects. It looks pretty good. These buttons, we'll talk about those, the ones that go around the perimeter here. They have a good spring to them. Um, nothing special as far as, you know, a tactile feel. You just kind of bottom it out and you know that you've hit the switch. Good spring pressure though. Not too hard, not too light. You really have to press on them. They have these nice aluminum button guards around all of them. Again, everything is just perfectly finished here. I can't find any defects anywhere. Just a real good looking setup. Now, the buttons that SimMagic is using here actually have LEDs in them. And I'll show you those towards the end of the closer look. So I like the LEDs. Some people are gonna, are gonna be on the fence about that, you know, but it's all subjective. But you can actually change the colors too on them. So that's pretty cool. So the buttons feel pretty good. I think they're spaced 
in a good ergonomic fashion. I can reach them without having to take my hand too far off the grip over here or the other side too, to where I can still maintain control and get to my buttons that I need to. And of course we have a seven way right in between those two buttons. And we'll talk about those next, the seven ways. We have two of them. So that's 14 moves we get on this wheel just in two locations. More manufacturers are starting to make wheels with these seven ways. Only like one had them before, but more are coming out now. Seeing the, seeing the light, as I say, that we really need you know, this kind of functionality on our wheels. 14 moves in two positions, especially for VR guys. They can do a lot without you know, having to look around for their buttons, even though they can remember a muscle memory eventually. But yeah, good feel to them going left or right or up or down. Just a good click, little tactile click there that you can feel. The encoders, very, very tightly spaced as any other seven-way that I've had. And so it's you can still pick one out, but it, you have to be careful about it and not grab two or three. And, but it is good tension, I think, on this encoder. Let's see this one over there. And this one feels exactly the same. So that's good. Good quality control between the encoders that they're using. And they are push buttons also. And a good tactile click there when you're pushing it. They have aluminum knobs on them. Let's give a little closer look at that aluminum knob. It has these grooves on it. And those grooves are actually have sharp edges to them. Not sharp enough to cut your finger or anything, but definitely sharp edges are good for gripping. I really like the way you, you can grip this with these. And the being small, it, it helps too. But easy enough, we got enough room between these two buttons, which is another issue with seven ways, by the way. You want to make sure you've got plenty of room to get in between the upper and lower button, or if they put a shroud around this thing. You know, sometimes that can get tight on your fingers. So that's something I also like to point out. But yeah, here we got plenty of room. No issues there. The encoders themselves, very nice, tight detent. I like these encoders. I've seen too many encoders come through the SRG where they were just kind of sloppy feeling. These are very solid, positive detents. Well-spaced, at least in my opinion. And I like what they're feeling like. It's easy to know that you grabbed one click. A good tactile feedback on these detents. One, two, one, two. I can do one, two, three, and I know I got three. One, two, three, got three. Go back to one. Again, I like deep detents or stiff detents, if you will. They feel deep because of the spacing and how stiff they are. So no complaints there. They just feel good. This is the kind of encoder I like to have on my wheels. Now, this is also a push button. See that? So both of them are push buttons, so it gives us another piece of functionality here. Now, I will point this out because that's what we do with the SRG. There is a little bit of play here in the shafts. I don't know how I can show you this without moving everything. There's a little bit there. See how it wiggles a little bit? And the one over here will do the same thing. Now, it surprised me to see that or feel that. As soon as I felt that, I said, what? Because I, I did the encoder part first, and it feels so stiff and nice that I was just shocked to feel that it had, had that much lash to it. But I think the reason it does is because it's a push button too. And I think to be a push button and have the, the strong detents it has, there has to be some, some wiggle room in here or lash or play to make this all function like it does. That would be my take on it because, man, these, in, these in detents feel really good. And aluminum knobs on it, just like on our seven-way, they have set screws in case we have to take the knobs off. I'll show you those. And they have the same grooves on them with the sharp sides. There's our set screws there. So, again, very positive engagement with just the fingers with just flesh. Or if you have a glove, very positive engagement there. Plenty of room to get your fingers on there with gloves or whatever and make things happen. So no real room issues. I think they've got a very good layout here as far as spacing for our buttons. So, yeah, nothing else I could say here. Uh, again, if I didn't say it already, the Carbon Wii looks very good on this. Very professionally presented. This is meeting expectations of a $700 or a little over $700 wheel. Of course, I have clutches on mine, so it takes the price just over $700. So we'll go around to the back, the aluminum housing. Nothing special here, just gets the job done. Has a nice finish on it. I can't find any defects on the finish. I mean, that goes for everything on here, it's just perfect. They're really doing a good job at some magic on these wheels. And it's just a bull nose roll off kind of finish on the edges here. Again, not sharp, but it doesn't have like a 45 degree slant to it or anything like some other housings that I've had through here. We have on the back a switch that we use for, you can see it says mode one, two and set. And that's for setting different things on the wheel, like the clutch bite points and things like that when we're using the clutches. So, I'll, and we'll go through a little bit more of that later on. We have the SimMagic wireless transceiver in here, 2.4 gigahertz. 
And of course, this is for matching up if you're not using it on a regular wheelbase, like, you know, just through USB, you put it on your Sim, or rather or your uh, Sim Magic wheel. And yeah, like the M10, it has the other transceiver on the front of it, which I really like with Sim Magic did that. Very close proximity on the wireless signal is always a good, good thing. I could never complain about that. Some manufacturers have to put them on the back of their solutions. And even with antennas and stuff, it's still not going to be as good as being in such close proximity as this stuff is. But like I said, it's wireless to begin with anyway. So it's never perfect when it comes to wireless. Only wired is the way to go with known dependability if your wires are good, obviously. <laughs> so what else on the back here? We have a USB piece here. You can see that there. And it's a little screw on there. It has a flat spot on the connector on the top. I don't know how that's showing up, but there it is. And we have a metal key in here that is going to key up with the other side when we plug this puppy in. The inside, you can see there is a plug in there. And that's for the electrical and USB pass-through if you're using a SimMagic compatible wheelbase, which would be the M10. That's the only one I've tested. And I've got a SimMagic quick release here. And there's the plug in the back there to plug into that. And of course, on the other side, we have the pins in there, which we might go over a little bit more on that later, even though I did cover it in my original SimMagic review. And we also have a hub here. It has a 70 PCD on the outside, and that's for guys who want to use this as a regular USB wheel. You just put your regular quick release on there, your wheel side piece of it anyway. Bolt it on. We're good to go. And of course, it has a smaller set of holes in here, and that is for our SimMagic quick release. You can see they are actually tapped threads in there. So we'd put this on the top and run our bolts back behind it right there. Easy enough. Now, so let's talk about the switches. Not the switches, but the switch list <laughs> shifters. So there's no switches in here. These are infrared units from what they say on their website. They have a nice crisp feel to them. Uh, not a real heavy pull on the magnets, but certainly not light. I think it's, it's kind of like in a sweet spot for most people, even though I'd like to feel a little bit more pressure there, but again, this is all going to be very subjective. So yeah, uh, you really can't complain about it. I think it's pretty good. We have adjustability in the paddles themselves. You see the slots there. I adjusted mine all the way out because again, I have a smaller hand and right out of the box, it was a little bit on the corner or the edge of the paddle for me, but yeah, bringing it out, put it right in the sweet spot for the pad of the tip of my finger there. So it feels pretty good, at least in hand. Again, once we run it, we'll know for sure if that's going to work out for us. We have aluminum housings on here. So these aluminum housings got little cutouts in them there. And we have aluminum levers for our shifters right in there. So everything is aluminum here except for our paddles. And they are three millimeter thick carbon units. And again, no defects in the weave on the back or the front I can find anywhere. So well done there. The nice little red accents here. Again, attention to detail is quite evident on this wheel, I think. And the clutches, let's talk about those. They have springs in them because that's how clutches work. The, and you can program left or right being your bike point. I'm going to use left because I ride a bike too, or a motorcycle, and that's, the clutch is always on the left. So for the final let out, I'll use that. Bike point will be a quick release on that one, then I'll slowly let it out here. We have good spring tension, I think, here. You don't want too light of a spring tension on your clutch pedals, paddles, rather, because, yeah, when you let it out, you want to feel some, some resistance against your finger to get that feel of where it is, right? Because it's not something that's pressure-based, but range-based. And yeah, I, I like what I'm feeling here. Not too stiff, but not too light. I think I'll be able to handle this pretty well with my pinkies. Or if you use other fingers for your clutch, whatever ones you use. So what else can we talk about here? Just, just nicely done. This is a very fine unit here. Meeting expectations for the price point and maybe even exceeding a couple of them compared to some of the other wheels that I've had into the SRG. So Magic is definitely working hard on their products to make them really top tier stuff or in the upper crust of the products that are available to us out there. Again, I'm, I'm a little surprised. <laughs> now let's talk about what comes with the wheel. Now, if you notice, this is a blank face on this wheel and there are no decals on it, which is kind of the way I prefer my wheels to be because I switch buttons around going to different games and different cars. So you kind of commit when you put stickers on, but you can put stickers on there if you want. I like the fact they didn't put them on from the factory because usually there's some things in there I'd want to do differently anyway, even though on the buttons themselves, we do have some indicators of, you can see what's on there. Got like a horn over here. I got a windshield wiper over here. But yeah, I can just ignore that, can't I? <laughs> so yeah, we get some decals. We get the warranty card. And with the warranty card, it says repair card actually on it right there. We get a little 1.5 millimeter wrench. And that is for 
taking our knobs off these encoders over here if we need to get inside and take a look inside. <laughs> and we also get these guys, and I'll show you why these came with the wheel. These are T-nuts and some bolts that go with those T-nuts. And that's so we can mount this remote piece that comes with this, and I'll show you that in a minute. But this is too small for 40 series. I think this is more for a 20 series. So it won't fit the 40 series, and it won't fit in the Simmagic M10 wheel housing. I tried that groove, and it's just too big for that. So I'm thinking they put them in for a 20 series for some reason. No problem. I've got, as you might imagine, some 40 series T-nuts I can use for that. The USB cable. 700 millimeters long before we even start stretching any of these tightly wound coils out. So this is going to be plenty of length for just about anybody, I would think. You know, make it too long, just don't make it too short. It's always been my motto to manufacturers. And yeah, this is one I can't complain about. They've definitely nailed it with this. And these connectors have a male end for our wheel connection and for our connection over there on that remote location for our connection. And you can see there's the six pins inside. We have a groove on the top to match our key in the female plug. And we have these nice steel and high quality as this is a rather thick collar here. I mean, some of them you feel, they're, they're like tinny feeling, you know, so thin. But this definitely has some, has some thickness to it. It just feels good. And we have a nice injection molded piece on the back, so very professionally finished. And we can see we have reliefs on there in our, so we can actually bend this a little bit without putting a kink in the wire. So a strain relief and, you know, all injection molded. We have a arrow on the top. Where's my arrow? There it is. A little arrow there coincides with the slot that's in there. So it helps us guide it as we're putting it into the USB connection over there. And let's go ahead and do that. Both of these are the same thing, by the way. They're both male sides. So nothing to see on the other side we didn't see here. I'm going to go ahead and plug this in. And again, I'm going to use my arrow. And then the arrow coincides with that flat spot. Again, I don't know how well you guys are seeing that in this video. But yeah, just line that up. And you might have to twist it a little bit one way or another to get it to go in, but chances are it'll go on in. And now we'll just go ahead and take the collar and tighten that puppy up. Let's see what kind of connection we got. All right, it's good and snug, and I'm tugging on it, wiggling it. No lash, no play. Yeah, this feels like a very solid and robust connection here. This connection's nice. Wow. It really, and it's small too. It's not real big. It's kind of smallish. So it really does a good job. And it's coming straight off the back of the wheel. Another thing I do like, instead of it coming out of the bottom or coming out at a 45 degree angle, I know I have plenty of clearance as far as my legs underneath or if you have anything on your rig that goes underneath the wheel or something, you'll have plenty of clearance. It won't be sticking in down into something and getting in the way. So yeah, again, they've done their homework, I think, here at Sim Magic for this wheel. I'm, I'm pretty impressed with this. <laughs> So let's go to the other side, and this is something I didn't expect to get, and this is why I said I was kind of impressed with the whole package here, is we get this remote location for our connector. And it's a piece of two millimeter thick carbon fiber. Maybe I can complain and wish it was like more like a three mil thick. Okay, there's a complaint. <laughs> and the weave is good. That's of course got the Sim Magic logo on there. And we have the same thing we have on the steering wheel. And that lets us see the other side of it too. And we have two holes here for mounting to profile typically, or you can drill holes in metal and tap them and, you know, however you want to mount it, obviously. So it mounts like this in the channel if we're using profile. And we have plenty of room in between the profile and the plug itself. And the only reason I, I make mention of that is some of the custom solutions that typically, that's the only place I've seen this kind of stuff is coming from a custom wheel producer, right? So now we have a production wheel having this stuff. So... It's good to see that SimMagic is actually doing these extra bits, going that little bit of extra mile, if you will, to make their product stand out. So, yeah. Now all we have to do is attach the other end of our USB cable to our remote location connector. And again, we're going to use our little arrow there. And you can see the flat spot here. You might be able to see it better on this one than you could when we had the wheel out here. But there it is. And yeah, just line up your arrow, push it home. And then we'll just start twisting that collar down. And yep, very nice and stiff. Very secure connection. I really, I like these little connectors they're using. I think that it's because they have a lot of thread in here. And you can really get a lot of reinforcement with this thicker ring on here that feels pretty substantial. Yeah, well done. So 
What we're going to do next is show you, before we end the closer look, I want to show you the lights on this. So we'll go ahead and plug it in. I think you'll be able to see this okay under our lights. You can see it kind of cycles through a boot up sequence. Here's colors, different colors. Wow, nice, huh? <laughs> I like the different colors actually, instead of just being having one color or just turn them all off. And you can see, I'm going to show you how this works real quick. If I press this button up here, the purple and neutral button, nothing's happening, right? It stays purple. But if I go to the back of the wheel and I turn the switch to the set like that, then if I come back over here, as I press it, it'll cycle through the different colors available. And there are a few. We've got purple. We've got a lighter blue. There's our dark blue there. So it's kind of more of an aqua marine blue. Then we have a white. And then we have off. So if you don't want any light, then you turn them off. Then we'll start with red. The next one is green. Yes, nice green. And then we have the same blue that we have on the one over there. And then we have the yellow neutral. I think that's yellow. Yeah, I'll call that yellow. Almost kind of a lime green. Then we have back to purple. So we can cycle through all those different colors on all these lights. You know, if I want to change the blue to something, I do the same thing. Press it. Now it's yellow. It's purple. Or it's a light blue. We'll stay with the aqua blue. And then when I go back to the back of the wheel, put our little switch back in the mode one or mode two position. Then we'll go back over here. If I push my buttons now, they don't change colors. I think this is pretty cool. Now I know the VR guys are going to say, well, that doesn't matter to me because I have VR hood. But you know what? You got to take that hood off sometime, right? <laughs> and you might like what you see on your wheel then. <laughs> But yeah, I, I like this. It's a very slick interface for changing the colors on the LEDs. And I've had more expensive wheels in here with LEDs on their buttons, and you couldn't even change the colors. So yeah, it's a little over $700. Sim Magic stepping up here, I think. <laughs> this is, uh, I really don't have much to complain about here, except, let's see, I can complain about the little bit of play here, more lash than I would like on that. Okay, there's one. In case you guys think I'm not complaining about anything, even though it's really not a complaint because everything works well. And the detents are awesome. The wires here right our usb wires there's no ferrite cores on here but of course i can always attach one one of the snap-on deals right so again if i, I want to nitpick and find stuff that you know that i think could be done a little better then i will that's what we do with the srg but other than that as you guys can probably see from this longish closer look segment they've done a very good job here this is a professionally presented product out of the out of the box and certainly is showing why it costs a little over 700 dollars meeting expectations and actually exceeding them in some other places like these custom design pieces here. So anyway, that's it for the closer look and we'll just get to the next segment. So let's take a look inside of this GT4 wheel. I've already taken the bolts and knobs off and screws so we can get access to it. And these are the encoder knobs. You can see the two shafts sticking out here and they are nice aluminum bits and they have a set screw down in there. That's how we take them on and off. And you can see there's a flat section on this shaft here. I'll get a little closer look. Show you that. that. And that's where the set screws fasten. So it won't turn or turn without turning the encoder shaft. Now we also have four main screws holding this on. It looks like to be M4s. These little flathead units right here. They are 2.5 millimeters for the wrench size, and they're 7.5 mil long on the threads, just the thread part. It's kind of an off size. Usually it'll have like 8 or a 6, but yeah, these are 7.5. And then we have up here on this section, you can see these two holes. We have an M3 screw that's very long, still the same flathead configuration, and that's a 2 millimeter wrench size on the head. Interesting, they have two different things there. All right, so now we're going to carefully separate the front plate from the housing. Actually, I've already looked down there. I've had to pull some of these plugs off, so. All right, so I'm gonna kind of cradle it with my bottom of my hand here and hope that uh, nothing slips away from me. First, we'll take a look at the housing here. And you can see we have these Molex terminated wires here. We have this one up here is for the shifter, and this one down here is for our clutch or analog axis, depending on what you're using. And we have the, both of them over here, the same thing. And, of course, we have the power lead coming out that will hook to the board here on this plug. 
that we can see through the hollow point that I showed you guys in the closer look. So now we're going to spin this around again very carefully so I can show you the circuit board part. Okay, don't want to drop this. <laughs> and there we have a very nice, neat, tidy looking circuit board. Now the reason I can't obviously separate it is because we have these USB wires over here that are actually soldered to that board. And again, there's the Mullocks for the center. Here's our wireless connection, our wireless board rather. And it looks like it's just kind of stuck on there, but it's not, it's surfaced or flow soldered onto the circuit board here. And of course we have our Molex plugs for our clutches and our shifters. They are not marked. I don't see any marking on that for the clutch or the shifter. But when you take them off, you can see that it's easy to put them back on the same way you took them off. Of course, we have our mode selector switch there. And yeah, not much else to see. Just a very neat and tidy layout in here, which is what I, I, I was expecting. <laughs> and again, the carbon fiber faceplate on this thing. Let me close this back up a little. This is a good way to, to get a better look at just how thick this thing is. That's five and a half millimeter thick carbon plate all the way through the top of this wheel. And I, you guys saw that in the closer look too. Just massive. It's, it's the thickest one that I can remember I've ever had in the SRG. So of course that lends itself to being very stiff and of course having the aluminum housing in the back and of course securely fastened with our screws on the front. Very stiff wheel indeed. And when I was driving it, it, it felt very good in hand as far as the force feedback effects coming back through the motor, including when I was driving it on the midge motor and the USB configuration. But yeah, there we have it. Look inside. Again, very nicely done here. Sim Magic is really doing a great job here with their wheels as, as far as I've seen. I've seen the GT1. I did the review on that when I initially did the motor review for their M10. And now we have the GT4. Now remember, this is an evolution of the original GT4 where it had a, an aluminum, some kind of aluminum front. I never had one in here, so I don't know for sure. That's what it looks like. And now, yeah, definitely upgraded with this big, thick piece of carbon fiber here. Yeah, so that's the end of the look inside segment. Now I'm going to attach my zero play from HRS adapter, wheel side adapter to the wheel so I can use it on my direct drive wheel and use a USB. And of course, you can also use this as you already know been watching this review using the Sim Magic wheelbase with the power pass through. But we won't have that, but we will get power through our USB 5 volt. It's a pretty simple thing here. This adapter has threads in it and the holes. So all the holes are threaded for M5. The only thing is it's going to be a little tricky getting in here. I've got little fingers. So this is one of the few times where it kind of pays off to be smaller. <laughs> you can get into tight places like this. I'm going to attach this. Like I said, it's not a big deal to do this. It's just using some M5 screws that I have. I've got little washers on them here, little stainless steel units. Now this is going to be kind of canted off to the side a little bit as far as this part is concerned. It won't be straight and level, which is very common with this adapter when I attach it to any 70 PCD because usually they're lined up straight up and down with the back of the wheel like this. So no big deal. We're used to that. And we can obviously in the software driver set it wherever you need it to be for center. So just a matter of pulling this, pushing one of these bolts through here, getting it lined up and start it, get it started. Really easy stuff here. I'm just going to use, I could use all five or six of these if I wanted to, but because it's kind of tight in here some places, I think I'm just going to do the, I don't know. I think I'm just going to do three for now. I might change my mind later and put the other three in. But for testing, I think this is fine. Three. I just, in three, I've never had a failure with three bolts in a wheel. And a lot of people just run three. But it's just one of those things that if there's a hole there for it, I kind of want to put something in it. You know what I mean? So anyway, it's a little tight in here, as you can see. I'm kind of maneuvering here to get this lined up and stretching my fingers all around to get it to go in. All right, so these will spin in pretty easy now. And it looks like we are the right length. We're not protruding out of the back of this hub, which you could. I mean, it really doesn't make that much difference, does it? So you can see I'm at a little bit of an off angle here. Again, no big deal. I just put it in the 
quick release, and then I'll do it in the software so the wheel is centered that way. Now, another thing here is it's not only just tight for your fingers, but you see those the heads of those bolts? Even if I was using a button head, which I don't like using, I, I like using socket head cap bolts. And so the problem is if I take a four mil wrench, which these are, that's the size of them, you can see we're going to have an issue here. It's not going to fit in there. And yeah. So what are you going to do? <laughs> now, even my little special ratchet that I have, a kit that I have that has a little teeny bits in it, even it's too tall to get in here. So yeah, this is pretty tight. So I had to pull out my specialty custom wrenches like these. And all this is is a regular wrench. At least that's how it started its life. And I get a lot of things coming. Well, over the years, I've got a lot of things that had Allen wrenches in them. And I usually save them in a, a separate little container. So if I need them I, to do something with them, I can. And in this case, I grab one of these and cut it off. So it was almost as long as this when it started out. Not quite, but pretty darn close. And so I just took an angle grinder with a cutting wheel on it and just cut that baby off. And then touch it up with a file just to make sure you don't have any burrs so everything goes smoothly when you put it in the head of the bolt. You can tell this is going to be a lot better. Again, you can take a hacksaw if you want. You don't need an angle grinder just to cut it off, but just dress it up nice. So now, hopefully, I'll be able to get this in here. I'm still a little cramped here for turning radius, but I shouldn't have to turn these very much, I'm hoping. So I'm in there now, and I can tighten it. So I'm, bo I'm bottoming out, though, against this. I'll have to take it out and do it again. But it's, like I said, I don't have very far to go, so I only have, probably have to do this one or two times. Here, here we go. Yeah, that's pretty good. I'm thinking I'm going to hit it one more time. Yeah, it's good. So I'm going to go down to this one over here and just do the same thing. Make sure I Tighten it up as far as I can with my fingers because I don't want to sit here all day turning it with this wrench one thing at a time. Well, that tightened up pretty good right away. We'll go around and get the bottom one, which is going to be the easiest one to get to. There we have it. Nice and tight. So, yeah, these little guys are worth their weight in gold once you actually get them cut down. So don't lose it. I always have a little special drawer place in my drawer for these guys. Right. So there we have it. It's mounted. Now all we have to do is go over and mount it to our wheelbase, plug in our USB cord, and when we come back, we'll see how that looks. So we have the GT4 mounted, and yeah, I like the way this looks. In fact, when you're sitting there and turning it, I don't know how, if this is going to show up right on the camera, but it kind of does a 3D thing with the carbon fiber pattern on there. Anyway, we'll see how that looks on the video. And I've got my color-coded buttons going on here. You know, it's kind of cool that we can actually change the colors on these buttons. I'm using, a, obviously, the Zero Play that we saw before when I was mounting the wheel side adapter for that. There's plenty of room as far as the quick release right in here and in between the shifters. And as I turn it, it seems to me that I could probably eliminate this hub and just put the quick release here. And that's going to bring it in closer to the hub here, the wheelbase side but I think there won't be any interference with anything. You know, it's about, like I said before, about 40 millimeters or so here. And yeah, I think it'll be a fine if you did that. I might experiment with that later on. And of course we have the USB plugged in the bottom here. Again, a very secure fit here. You know, when you have things mounted up to a solid rig like this, you can feel things a little differently when you have it mounted. And this is a very stiff connection here. I really like the quality of this connection. It gives me a lot of confidence that nothing will happen to it. And if I turn this around, you can see I've got, usually I only have one coil or loop, if you will, of coiled cable around my hub here. But this thing is so long that I decided to go ahead and do two. And yeah, it's working out fine. And we're going to go down here and see where we did the custom plate mount. So it's easy to take this on and off. Again, you can see it's nice and securely connected here. Only thing here is I would like to see a wider piece for here. And the only reason is this. To get this to fit in a 15 series or 40 series, this is actually 40 series hardware here, then it'd be nice to cover up those T-nuts. So if it was a bit wider, you could do that. But I could see why they designed it the way they did to keep it compact. 
because if it gets too wide, then you might have a problem. But again, I'd like to have enough to hide the T-nuts. And I had to do the T-nuts the long way, like you see here, go around here. And that's another reason why they're sticking out, because if I turned them around and flipped them around the other way, they would butt together, and then these holes here would be too close. Right? In other words, I couldn't get the screws in. The, the holes would, would not be close enough the way that if you turned them that way. So maybe a little wider or to get the spacing so that you could turn them around. It wouldn't have to be that much, I think. Anyway, just one of those things that I observe when I'm using this stuff. And, of course, if we look around the back, you can see that there's the other side of it, and it's going back over to my USB hub. So, yeah, no complaints here. Everything's looking good. It feels good. I've actually driven it a little bit already, and it's a very stiff wheel. It lets all of the force feedback come through through this direct drive motor that I'm running, and this is a Direct Force Pro from VRS, a 20 newton meter midge that I'm testing at this session. I may be testing it with something else later on. But yeah, we're ready to get in and do some driving and see what we think. I'm going to install the Sim Magic quick release now. And remember, on the back of this, we have a plug in there and a circuit board. And this two wire cable plugs into that. And it needs to plug into the wheel itself. And this is how we're going to provide power to the wheel because we're not going to be running our USB connection, right? Simple enough. Now, when you get your quick release, you order one like this. They give you a bag of screws. These are button head M5s. I'm not going to be using the button heads because I have some socket head caps. I just prefer using these. Same length. These are M5s, obviously, so they'll fit into our threaded holes back here, just like that. Now, this is going to be a little bit tricky because I have to get down underneath here and put the bolt through and then get this connected. But before I do that, because again, we want the power pass through, I've got to stick this in that plug in there. Better to stick it in here first, I think, and then into the back or inside of our quick release assembly. Because it, yeah, having this up here with the thing and then yeah, doing all that could get a little bit out of sorts, I think. Anyway, do it any way you want to. I'm gonna be using these guys. And these are little medical grabbers, little duck bills, I call them. So I should be able to grab this and plug it in down here very gently. And I'm going to be pushing against the plug part. I'm not going to be cinching down on the wires. I'm just kind of holding it by the wires, right? I'm going to end up pushing it this way. At least that's the idea once I get it in here. So I'm going to kind of grab it sideways. Easy enough to get it positioned in that plug. You guys won't be able to see this because there's no way for me to shoot this. It's so far down in here. But yeah, it's easy enough to get the wires gripped and then plugged in here. But you want to be careful what you're using here because you don't want to get up against the circuit board with anything that will cause any harm. I want to try. Actually, I think I'm going to go by the plug. It doesn't seem like I'm doing a very good job with just the wires. And it might help if I pre-bend it a little bit. These wires, because they seem to be kind of stiff, not real flexible. They're not silicone type of wires, if you will. So now I got a little bend to it. Now I can grab it and put it in there. It's very tight, so you, you have to pay attention to what you're doing here. So the idea is to make it nice and flat so it will go in there. Just a bit fiddly. There we go. I'm going to kind of press on the plastic piece so I can get it in there. And you want to make sure that you don't slip. Because if you slip and touch the circuit board that's in here or scrape it, you know, they got all these little pieces on it you can see in there. Yeah, you don't want to hit any of that stuff. <laughs> That's probably ruin your day pretty quick. Okay, so now that I have that part done, all I've got to do is do the same thing. And this one, this one's already kind of pre-bent, so it'll go sideways and get in there. And now I can, I don't know how well you guys will see this, but you know what I'm doing. <laughs> get that plug oriented to where I need it to be. It'll, it kind of gets started into the plug or that's on the board. But again, something like this, or just a set of tweezers or something, come in very handy for this kind of operation. Turn this around a little.
Make sure I guess I got enough slack. <laughs> this is going to be a bit fiddly. I might have to speed this up here a little bit to get this to do what I want it to do. I'm going to bend it again. Getting that bend in there really helps. All right. I'm almost going to do it with my fingers. Almost. Just want to get it started like that. Once you get it in front of the plug or started to the front of the plug, you should be able to just grab the back of the plastic. Kind of snudge it in there. There it goes. You heard that click? So now it's in. All right. It's like doing surgery. <laughs> now I want to orient the label up, or I want to make sure that the five ball bearings are on the top because that's the way this needs to go on so these contacts will line up with these contacts. Little things like that you want to pay attention to. Now, this might be on the bottom when you see that, but this is movable. I can actually spin this red piece around wherever I want it to be. So it doesn't, you make it where you want it to be. All right. Now for the trickier part. We've got to get three bolts in this thing. And what I'll typically will do, will go in first with the bolt, if I can get it in the hole. All right. And then I'll line up the quick release on top of it. And I'm going to kind of tilt this up, if this works right. And kind of just keep my fingers in here. Yeah, this is a bit fiddly. You know, probably the easiest way is to go inside, take everything apart, and take this hub off. <laughs> but I don't want to do that right now. I'll save that for the look inside. All right. So again, I'm kind of looking down here, getting it lined up where I think I need to have it lined up. And because I don't have a lot of room for my fingers here, it's not easy to get this bolt to start. It's very, you got to kind of jiggle it around. And I'm kind of spinning this too to help me out. So I can turn it sideways. <laughs> yeah, I think I got it started now. Okay, there we go. All right, so now we're started. Now I only have two more to go. And I'm kind of going to do the same thing to these guys. And I'm probably going to speed this up because you know what I'm doing here. Okay, now I have them started, and I'm going to kind of hang it down this way and take the weight off of it because I can get in better to the head of the screw this way. Now that I've got the pattern started, I'm good. So I'm just going to tighten them down with my fingers. Obviously, I can't leave them just tightened down with my fingers. So there is something else we're going to have to do. If you'll notice here, <laughs> we have a bit of an issue. I'll show you here. Let me get this one spun down a little more. There we go. That is clearance. See how tight that is? As far as getting a wrench in here and trying to tighten that puppy down, if I took a regular, and these are four millimeter wrenches, if I took a regular one of those out of my kit, pull this out, and tried to get this in here, yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> it's, <laughs> I mean, there's no way to get into that the head of that like this, right? So what do you do? Well, even my small mini ratchet won't get in there. It's so tight. So, because we've also got a, see that screw head coming out of there? It even makes it worse than if I was trying to put a regular quick release on here because they're kind of offset from that, those holes. But not all is lost. I have this guy. Now I have several of these in different sizes. These are just regular cheapy hex wrenches that you get with different products that you can buy. You know, they come in the kit. They give you a couple of hex wrenches to do stuff with. So what you do is, and this used to be the same size or close to it as far as reach goes as the, the four here. But it's a lot smaller now, isn't it? So all you do is take a hacksaw, or in my case, I just took a grinder, wheel grinder, and just cut it off. And then touch it up with a file to make sure you don't have any burrs or anything, obviously. And this is worth its weight in gold when you run into this. So all I have to do now is get in here with my specialty tool and tighten everything up. 
Where to go in the head here? There we go. So now I can tighten it. This this keeps you from doing a lot of work. As far as I would have had to take this hub off, take the wheel apart, take the hub off to make this work because of the reach issue that we have here. And it's still going to be a little tight to get it completely tight because I don't have a lot of swing room in some of these. So I'm going to have to repeat it. You know, do that little one turn, come back and do another little teeny turn and take forever and you're getting mad at it because it takes so long. So this will go pretty slowly. But it's better than having to take the whole thing off. I still save myself a lot of time. There it is. Ready to go. Now we could just take this hub off. If I was just going to run this on this only, then I could take this whole hub off. Take the wheel apart, take the hub off, and just put this Sim Magic hub directly to the back of the wheel. Because this sticks out so far on this, see how far this sticks out? Once I'm on this, I've got a ton of room back here. Right, so I don't even need the extra, I think that's about 40 millimeters on this hub. I could just take that off, put this flat on there, and I would still have plenty of clearance for my clutches and my shifters, right? That's the only consideration really. But because I'm going to be using this on a regular USB direct drive wheel also in testing, then I'm leaving it on there, okay? So you can take that off and just be done with it, unless you decide to use it as a USB wheel sometime later on. All we have to do now is get everything mounted up and we'll come back and see what that looks like. Now I have the GT4 mounted to the Simagic M10 wheelbase. And as you can see, the way this shaft comes out of this wheelbase and the hub that they have on that, there is plenty of room here for the shifter and clutch paddles to clear the wheelbase. So there's no interference. And the reason I say that is because you could actually, just like I said on the other setup that I had when I was running USB, you could get rid of this hub this, if you wanted to, although it does make it easy to put this on instead of opening up the button plate itself to put it on, but you could get rid of that and it would be no problem. There's just so much reach here anyway. It looks good. We got the wireless connection going on. We got a green light over on the wheelbase and we have our green light on the back of the wheel. I don't know how that's going to show up because it's not as bright as the one on the wheelbase, but there it is. Everything is functioning properly. So now all we have to do is get in and start our testing. All right, guys, we're going to go over the dual clutch system on the GT4 and how it works. We're going to superimpose some information on the screen also. And you can see we have the race manager open and a back look at the wheel. So what we're trying to do here is pull in both clutches at the same time. And you can see my dial up there is doing that. And then take off by floor, putting the throttle all the way down, snapping the bite point out. So it starts the car rolling without spinning the wheels. And then we can follow through with the left hand clutch and get a nice clean start without spinning our wheels. That's the point of what we're trying to do. So to do this on the GT4, there is a system you have to use. There is a mode button back here on the back that you saw in the closer look. And right now it's in mode one. So when I pull the clutches in, you can see the clutches are working, right? Here's the left and there's the bite point. Let the bite point off. It's at 1791. Then I would slowly let the rest of it out with the left hand clutch. Now, to set this up, we have to use the mode selection button. Mode one right now, if we go to mode two, that puts these clutches in analog axis mode. So they're individual. So I pull the right, it has its own axis. And if I pull the left, it has its own axis. But we're going to go one past that. We have to be in set mode to make this work. Now, I'm going to pull the left clutch in, which is the one I'm going to let out last. And we go over here to the right encoder, and it's a push button and an encoder. We push down on it, do the push button, and we can turn the dial. You can see I can change this where the bite point is, right? I can put it no bite point if I want to, and both clutches work the same and just let it out. Well, you can't do it on the bite point, but I can just let the whole thing out with the left clutch like that. But that's not what we want to do. You can't use the bite point that way. So what I'm going to do is turn it back. And as I do that, I'm watching the numbers. I'm going to go ahead and put it at 1919. And we're going to test it. So I'm going to go ahead and pull both clutches in. <laughs> I can't put, I push my foot on the foot clutch. That's a habit. And now I'm going to give it full throttle and see what happens. See the car is rolling. We're not spinning.
Oh, and you notice I'm not shifting. I can't shift yet. And the reason it's not shifting is because I still have it in set mode. So you really can't shift. It's really just to get your bite point. I'm going to dial some more bite point in. I'm doing that. I'm going to still be in set mode. I'm going to go ahead and pull the clutch in. And I'm going to put it down to 1791. Actually, let's put it down to 1663. All right, so this time I'm going to do some shifting. So I have to put my mode switch back to mode one, and then I'm all set up. So let's do it again. Snap it out, and you can see, yeah, I don't know if you can see my mirror in the, the bottom shot with, the, with me in the cockpit, but there's some skid marks up there. So 1663 was too much. I want to adjust that. I'll flip it back over, hold it down, and then I'll push it back up to 1791, put it back in mode one, and now we'll try it again. There we go. 1791 is the sweet spot because it didn't spin and I was able to take off without spinning the wheels and then slowly let off the clutch and then start going through the gears. Now we'll go ahead and do that one more time. We'll go ahead and get to a straight over here. I actually did that on purpose. I slipped it a little. <laughs> this, is a, a fro this car is very powerful, so it will spin wheels very easily. So let's get straight on here. There we go. All right, so here we go. Testing it one more time. We're at 1791 in our dial. Put down the bite point one more time. There we go. So no wheel spin. I got a clean start. And that's what it's all about. Very simple to do. And I like that you have a graphical representation of this when we're doing it because you can kind of tell what's going on. You can see what the number is. If I didn't have that up there, I could still do it, but I'd have to fidget a little bit more to find the sweet spot. We're gonna do this one more time. And I'm gonna put it back at set. I'm gonna go back to 1663, just to verify, I still get wheel spin there. Put it back to mode one, get down to gear one. There we go, we'll try it again. Yep, <laughs> you can see I'm, I'm still spinning the wheels. So, no doubt, 1791 is where I want to be, so I'll put it back in there. Go ahead, put it back to mode one, and now one more time. <laughs> you can see this is a real light, powerful car, and it's even with this dual clutch and the bite point and all that good stuff going on for you, you can still spin the wheel just letting out the clutch, the left clutch, too fast. But anyway. Pretty simple system to use. Again, I like the way it has a graphical interface. I can see exactly where I'm at. And yeah, that's the dual clutch mode or dual clutch function for the SimMagic GT4 wheel. We are at Sebring and iRacing in the Ferrari 48 GT3. And this is a good place to test this wheel. I'm using it in the standalone or USB mode first. And this is so I can test it for those people who are looking for a good overall wheel, all arounder for their simulation and they have a servo motor or a different type of direct drive wheelbase other than sim magic and this is a very stiff wheel if you guys have been following along a five and a half millimeter thick front carbon plate with the aluminum housing on the back bolted together yeah it comes in pretty stiff and it's doing a great job here on this midge 20 at full torque i don't feel any flex anywhere it's just doing what it should be doing especially at the price point and the grips on here are big and beefy, and they have just enough give on them or in them that gives you just a little bit of damping for that really, you know, that really intense. I, I run a lot of detail in my force feedback, and these some of these shots are pretty intense, and some of the details can be pretty intense. It can be fatiguing over longer stints. But this grip is beefy enough, and it has enough cushion in it that it dampens that just enough that you still get the feel that you need to control the car. But... It's comfortable for longer stints, and I, I like the, that combination. So no complaints there as far as the grip, except that I do like to wear gloves, and gloves are not very good on this rubber grip here. It's better with bare hands like you see me driving now. Uh, the only gloves I could use with it were the Gorilla Grip gloves that are those thin rubber membrane gloves that we use for mechanic stuff. But yeah, they worked and they gripped fine. But other than that, bare hands the way to go, and that might be what you want anyway. Now we're over on the M10 from SimMagic. I thought I'd do it on the wireless solution obviously to see how it behaved there and again very stiff and the m10 obviously cannot put out the kind of torque that that m20 can or the midge 20 
some people, I'd call it the M20. <laughs> so, yeah, doing a good job here, too. I'm looking for things to complain about on this wheel. The button layout's good. I can reach everything from the grip position with my thumb, and except for the encoders, obviously, because they're further in. And you have to take your hand off the grip anyway to use an encoder because you have to use two fingers to twist it. And the same thing goes with the seven way. With your thumbs, you can grab it and manipulate it. But if you're going to use the encoder function, you have to remove your hand for that. But other than that, this, all the other positions of that seven way are readily available. So not a lot to complain about the button layout. And the colored buttons, well, that's, you know, that's totally subjective whether you like that or not. You can always turn them off if you don't. So uh, I kind of like them and the way you can change them. They have a good feel to them, the buttons when you press them, a good tactile click on it. You know when you've pressed it, and yeah, no issues there. These shifters are the same way. There's no second guessing if you've made one shift, two shifts, or when I do a rapid fire downshift of four, and then I usually add the fifth one for the last. But yeah, always a very nice tactile feedback there. I know exactly what I'm doing when I'm hitting them, and good feel as far as the how much of a tension there is on it when you're pulling it, how much effort you use to snap that shifter free. And I might like it just a hair uh, stiffer or more tension on it for me to pull, but that's totally subjective. They did a great job. I could live with this with no, no problem, obviously. So yeah, shifters are good. Clutches have the good spring tension in them. So when you're doing the second phase of your clutch release on the dual clutch mode, that it's enough spring tension there that lets you modulate it as you should be able to. Too light of a spring and it's not easy to do. Too heavy a spring and it's gonna be hard to do. It's gonna wear your finger out if you do it too much. But then again, it's usually only during the start, so yeah. But you don't want it too weak of a spring and yeah, it passes that test there just fine. Again, what else can I say about the wheel? It's just getting the job done here. I think at the price point it comes in, you do get a good product here. And it would be one of the wheels on my list uh, if I was looking for a standalone 300 millimeter wide GT type wheel that is going to perform quite well no matter what kind of direct drive servo motor that I throw at it.
final thoughts on the new GT4 racing wheel from the guys at Sim Magic. Out of the box, the GT4 has a quality feel to it. The grip design fills my hand in a way that feels comfortable to me. When you hold the GT4, it feels light, yet very stiff. Which makes sense when you see that it has an aluminum housing and a 5.5mm thick carbon frame, which is the thickest carbon frame I have ever had on a wheel here at the SRG. The GT4 has two 7-way joysticks that give the driver 14 different inputs from only two locations. Good to see more wheels coming to market with this much utility. The push buttons on the wheel have a good tactile feel in them, and they also have colored LEDs that allow you to change the color of each individual one. And you have a total of seven different colors to choose from on each button, or you can just turn the LEDs off. There are two rotary encoders that have what I consider very good detent feel in them. They also have a push button feature. Except for these encoders, all of the controls are easy to reach with my thumb from the grip position. The shifters on the GT4 are made from aluminum with adjustable carbon paddles. They are contactless units that use infrared sensors. I found them to have a very good tactile feel and really just a pleasure to use. The clutches are made the same way as the shifters with good spring tension. Setting up the bite point on the clutch was quite easy without any dramas trying to get a good launch with no wheel spin. I use the GT4 as a USB wheel and connected to the SimMagic M10 wheelbase. For USB use, it comes with a very nice coiled cable and remote mount solution with excellent cable connectors installed on the wheel and the cables. It performed well in both setups. Just one of those wheels that feels right when using it. If you're looking for a GT styled wheel that has a lot of available functions and a very sturdy build, I would have the GT4 on my list of the ones to consider. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.